worship team. It's a good time of worship. Good to see everyone here tonight. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, I wanted to just share some thoughts that um, it's been a while um, since I have kind of thought about them and actually speak this, spoke this message before. But as I was um, just preparing for tonight, um, these thoughts, they were just coming to me and uh, something that's definitely touched my heart, um, I wanted to share with you guys tonight. Um, so if you have your Bibles open um, and with you, if you can open them to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 27. Psalms, chapter 27, and we're just going to read one verse. That's verse number four. It's a psalm that David wrote. Um, some there's debates and um, maybe some discussion of when exactly this psalm was written. Uh, some scholars say that it was during the time when he was being chased and pursued by King Saul. Um, others say that this was toward the end of his life, uh, toward um, when he's lived most and experienced everything that he has gone through. And here he is reflecting on these things. Um, for the sake of this message, I prefer the latter part um, of these debates and topics, but um, either way we can take them. So the David here says a few things in verse 4. He says, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And so very, um, just a short verse that we read, but there's three things that David says here, and I just want to um, just go into them a little bit and, um, and just discuss them and just bring some things out for us to ponder about and to think about. Um, David's probably, uh, probably one of the most well-known characters of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and someone that probably from early years, uh, starting from Sunday school, it's probably somebody that we know about. Like probably the, the first or one of the first stories that, that we learn as, as kids, especially maybe more so boys, um, is David and Goliath. Like that's just like a, just, uh, it's, um, it's, it's just that story that we resonate with, right? It's, it's just there. It's, it's a battle. There's the small guy, there's the big guy. And the big guy loses and the small guy wins. And so David comes, you know, so close to heart on so many, on so many levels. And just growing up and reading and preaching and, and, and uh, just learning the different characters of the Bible. David, we know so much about him. And there's so many different facets of his character and of him as a person. So it's, it's, it's good, a, a good person to learn from and to, to see what we can take away. And so David here, he writes this psalm and he says, uh, he says in this verse, he says, One thing have I asked of the Lord. One thing I have asked of the Lord. And, and if we um, try to understand that, like David's saying, the one thing that I ask of the Lord, and we understand that David... David asked a lot of things of the Lord. Like this was not the one thing that David asked of God. There were a lot of, if we look at the life of David, there were so many things that David asked of God. He had a lot of different needs, a lot of different requests, a lot of different problems that he came to God with. But here David says, the one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after. Um, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. So there's two things that he says that don't kind of make sense at face value. Number one, David, you haven't just asked one thing. You've asked for multiple things. And number two is how can you desire to be in the house of the Lord that, that does not yet exist? How can you want to be in the house that is not yet there? Uh, the tabernacle was in a tent. Uh, David came towards the end of his life to God and said, God, I feel, I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. I live in a beautiful house that I build, a nice palace filled with rich things and comfort and, and so on. And your tabernacle is in a tent. And so he had the intent to build a house for God. But 
but it was his son that would later build it, Solomon. And so speaking these things, I, I was kind of going through them and saying, David, what's going on? David, what are you talking about? One thing, I understand that it's not one thing that you have asked for. Number two is um, how can you desire to be in the house that is not yet there? And so as I did more reading and searching and studying, and um, what I came to is what David is saying here. He says, the one thing that I desire and that I will seek after, the most important thing that I want, if, if, you know, if I could narrow it down to one thing, the most important thing to me is to be in the house of the Lord. And if you do some word studies and, and, and so on, what he's saying is the most important thing for me and the one thing that I desire is to be in the presence of God all the days of my life. And so simply put, and unwrapping these things that David is saying here, simply put, he's saying, I have come to a point in my life where the one thing that I want, the one thing that is most important to me is to be in the presence of God and to spend the rest of the days of my life in his presence. And so when I was going through this and, and uh, trying to tie this in with the New Testament, I, there's some interesting times when we come once again and, and we encounter this one thing, um, one thing um, word or one thing saying. Um, it was a time when Jesus was um, walking the streets of, of Israel and he met a young ruler. He met a rich man. And I'm just going to reference this. This is Mark 10. Uh, verse 21 and 22 and this young man came to Jesus and he says Jesus what must I do to be saved and so Jesus tells him about the commandments about the way he needs to live his life and then this young man says he says look Jesus I've done all these things from the days of my youth and um when Jesus comes to him Jesus Jesus says that all these things uh, that you have done uh, they are good, but he comes to him and he says, you lack one thing. He says to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And unfortunately, this young man, what happened? He turned away. He was sad. Why? Jesus says, you have done all these good things. You've lived a good life, a life of example. You followed all the commands. But in reality, the one thing that you are lacking, the one thing that you are lacking, you've done all this good. You've lived a good life. You followed my laws. But the most important, you missed. The one thing that is missing is that your heart is with your riches your heart is with your wealth and so what I want you to do is sell all your riches give it all away distribute it to the poor and come and follow me you have made it so far but you're missing the most important part he says you're missing the most important part sell it all to show me to prove to me that it is you who wants to have me as this number one thing in their life. And so um, the other time that we find is when Jesus comes to the house of Martha and Mary. And we know this story well. Martha decides to make this big banquet. And I can only imagine, especially coming from a Slavic background, like when people come over, um, you know, like I think the our, our generation would probably like we'll order some pizza or maybe get something at Costco at best, like a few like some wraps and some croissant sandwiches and like. But like if we like our parents' generation, like when there's a feast or people coming over, you know, there's like five types of salads. There's like kartoshka and like you know pilimeni and like olivier and all these things, right? So like there's a huge feast. So imagine like this is when you know family comes over. Imagine if your mom found out, like, Jesus is coming over. Like, that'd be a lot of food, right? I mean, she'd be, I, and I imagine Martha, right, she finds, you know, Jesus is coming over. So she's probably got a huge menu going on. 
she's probably expecting like Mary's gonna help me so she's trying to in all this what she's doing all she's trying to do she's just trying to serve Jesus she just wants to serve him with the talents that she has as a woman at that time and that was cooking so she's making this huge feast and so while she's preparing all of this uh, Jesus is with his disciples they're talking deep theological things probably and asking him of the kingdom of heaven and all this is going on and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus just soaking all this in uh, Mary is being she's not serving Jesus but she's being served by Jesus uh, through what he is saying and she's just soaking all this up because she's at a place in her life when she needs to be served by Christ and so Martha's doing all these things and you know her her um, you know pie is burning up uh, stuff is boiling over she's got a mess in the kitchen and she gets to a place where she's frustrated and imagine Jesus sitting there with his disciples and um, you know they're having this t talk and she just comes as like a frustrated lady that's got burnt stuff on the stove and she says Jesus do you not care that I'm struggling here and Mary's just hanging out and Jesus says these same words to her, to her that he said to this rich young ruler that David says. He says, Martha, you're trying to do so much, but only one thing you lack. Mary has chosen this part. And so, you know, a lot of times in our life, we like this maybe young rich ruler. We, we have a lot of things. We, we try to acquire a lot of things. We, we live by the word. We live maybe by the law. We do all the right things, but our hearts are not with God. They're somewhere else. The most important things to us is, is, is not God, but something else. And maybe we go through the motions. Maybe we do the right things. We say the right things. We sing the right songs. We pray the right prayers, but our hearts are far from God. Or maybe we're like Martha. We're so involved in so many things. We use our talents and we sing and we preach and we minister and we do these things. And it's like we're trying to do so much. We're trying to, through all these things that we do for God, we get so busy serving God that we forget the most important thing. We forget about God himself. We forget about this relationship that we need to have with him, spending time in his presence, spending time of just not doing anything, but just sitting at his feet and allowing Jesus to minister to you. And here Jesus is saying, look, just do less, but spend more time with me. And um, the, the next thing that another time when Jesus mentions this, this um, or the Bible actually mentions this thing, is when Jesus heals this blind man who was uh, born blind. And uh, the Pharisees, they come to his parents and they say, look, this man that healed your son, he's not a good man. He's an evil man. And they try to catch him in, 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 in uh, professing Christ. And if they would do that, they would be kicked out of the synagogue. So they come to this man and they say, look, was this man a sinner? Um, or this man was a sinner who healed you. And this man says, he says, look, if he was a sinner or not, I do not know. But he says, one thing that I do know is that I was blind, but now I see. And he's saying, he's like, look, I didn't know who this man was. I don't know much about him. But when I came into his presence, when I came into the presence of this man, into the presence of Christ, I am able to see. And, you know, that's, that's so, it, it spoke to me so vividly and clearly because a lot of times our Christianity a lot of times we try to prove things and we try to you know debate things and and what's so important is once we experience the presence of God like a lot of these things they they somewhat become irrelevant we say look all these things yeah they have a place but the most important part for me is being in the presence of God because in this presence when I spend time in the presence of God I I'm able to see. I'm able to live. I'm able to see where I'm going, where I am headed, and where I'm supposed to be. And so when we look back at what David is saying in Psalm 27, verse 4, what David is saying, and um, if we imagine him writing this psalm, like if you look at David, he's the youngest kid in his family. Um, when the prophet comes to 
anoint the young king, a new king. Um, like David doesn't even get invited to this table. He's somewhere out there. Like his father and his brothers and his family, they did not even like have a slight thought that, hey, maybe it's David. We should probably have him here. Like he was, he was not a, a kid that everybody was, you know, like babies, like babies always get the most attention and loved. Like looking at how he is treated, he probably wasn't that kid. He wasn't that baby that was most loved. He was out there somewhere. And David comes from these lows, comes from a time when he comes even to the battle against Goliath. And his brothers are like, man, you're like, they're like making fun of him and putting him down. And, and David comes from these lows and he becomes instantly like the most famous person in Israel everybody knows David people are starting to sing songs about David um, the women want to see David they want to marry David I'm sure right he becomes like the hottest guy in town and not just in town in the whole country in the whole kingdom eventually David becomes the most powerful man in Israel he gets uh, crowned as king of Israel he is the most well-known the most powerful eventually the most most richest man so he's experienced all these things he's experienced a life that probably most people couldn't imagine and so when David experiences all these things he comes to a conclusion he says the one thing that I seek for the one thing that I am after after having all these things David comes to a conclusion that the most important thing in my life is to spend the rest of my days in the presence of God. And that's so, um, it's so humbling in a sense of this man that had so much to his name, that had so much power, might, and so on. He comes to the understanding that all these things are meaningless, that all this fame, all this power, all this money, everything that I have acquired, it's all meaningless. The most important thing for me is to spend the rest of my days in the presence of God. You know, he, living here in this earth and especially in, in the place that we live at, there is something that, that I like to call the, the lie called if only. The if only lie. You know, uh, we as people, like we think that if only we had something that we don't already have, like we would be set and we would be happy and we would be content and like that's it. We could like live peacefully. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that. Like I don't know, maybe you're in a place right now and you're like, man, if only I had that one thing, I'd be good. Um, I remember I was 16. I got my first job or maybe second job. Um, and I like had this desire for an S-Class Mercedes. Like that's what I wanted. Um, I saw those things everywhere. I wanted a black one. Um, and anyway, so, you know, and I had this like, like a young kid, like a young guy. I was like, man, once I get this car, like, that's it. Everything is going to be good. And I did eventually get this car. Um, I remember got the windows tinted right away. Um, I was like, I probably watched that thing every day for like an hour, vacuumed it. I mean, like, it was a nice car. Um, I wasn't able to buy a new one. It was used. Um, you know, I was 16. I think my interest rate was like 20 something percent, uh, or like high teens. I don't remember, um, you know, expensive insurance and everything, but I was like, that was my dream. I thought, you know, once I get it, it's going to be good. And I, and it was good for a while. Um, and you know, um, up until like I started getting the car payments, <laughs> and I was like, "All right, man, I gotta pay this thing off." Um, and then uh, one time I was driving to church and I was texting, and I like hit this pickup truck in the back, and totally like ruined the whole front end of this dream that I had, this car. And you know, I really didn't want one from the auction. I wanted one that was like, you know, not uh, you know done the Russian way. And so I'm sitting here with this car that I like, you know, still owe a lot of money for. So I'm like, well, you know, I have full coverage. Maybe they'll write it off because it was pretty bad. And so when they invest, invest uh, the, um, uh, the thing came back when they checked it out and gave me an estimate, like it was a few hundred dollars short of totaling. And so they're like, well, yeah, you can fix it. And 
So I fixed it. It was fixed well, everything. But like two or three months into owning this dream or this car that I was supposed to, you know, be happy with and it was supposed to make me happy, I had a car that, you know, was already wrecked that I still owed a bunch of money for. And I understood there, like, you know, this car is not, like, it's not that great. Um, and that was 14 years ago. Um, I still, actually, I still have the car. It, like, it doesn't really drive. It's parked in front of my house now. It's probably worth maybe a few thousand dollars, if that. But for me, um, that was a lesson that I learned early on. Um, you know, and other people have other things. Like, maybe for somebody, it's a different car. And, and we say, like, if only we get this car. Or maybe if we're, you know, have bigger dreams. Like, we say, if only I own a house. Or if only I, I have this size of a house. Or in this neighborhood. But unfortunately, like, if you've ever been there, like, you get that thing. And there's, like, a short amount of time when that thing is enough. But then it's the next thing. It never stops. You always want more. You, there's nothing that will quench this desire inside of us until we realize one thing that David realized. He says, the only thing that I want, the only thing I desire is not wealth, is not riches, is not fame, is not power. The one thing that I desire is to spend the rest of my days in the presence of God. Friends, and like um, for me, um, it's something that I I work on on a daily basis because we are we live in you know arguably the most uh, prosperous country in the world right the the opportunities are endless um, the things you can acquire physically materialistically are endless everything is at our fingertips but David here is is calling us or, or showing us after experiencing things that we probably can't get to unless we hit a really big jackpot or something, that even when you get all these things, they all still don't matter. In the end, the most important thing is to be in the presence of God. And when we spend this time in the presence of God, the next thing David says, he says, and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Um, you know, like growing up, God was never described to me personally as like a beautiful God, right? That's almost like, like now that I say it, it's like it's almost wrong to say or wrong to think. Like God was usually, you know, when he's drawn, he's usually an old white man with white hair, white beard, all white. Um, when he was maybe described to us in even Sunday school and behind the pulpit, like a lot of times it would be God would be um, a just God, a God that we need to fear and a God that, you know, he's just waiting for you to do something wrong to like, you know, hit you with a stick or hit you with a lightning rod as soon as something bad happens, right? But David here, he says that I want to spend the rest of my days in the presence of God, in the presence of God. And David says to gaze at the beauty of God. And, you know, when we begin to spend time in the presence of God, we begin to understand something about God. That God is beautiful. And, like, it's so hard to explain that. Like, how do you explain the beauty of God or how beautiful God is? Like, if we would think of, like, what's the most beautiful place or thing that you have seen or that you have experienced, right? Like, for a lot of people, that's nature. For a lot of people, um, I don't know, like, I've had a lot of moments um, traveling this country, other countries. For me, it's probably nature. Like, if you're standing at a, like, on the top of a tall mountain and you just, and you feel like, if you guys have ever felt like being in awe of beauty, being in awe of something that, like, it's like this feeling or this experience like it's so much to take in it's so much to see and it's like like you want to spend your time there like it's so beautiful it's so precious and imagine like all these things that we experience and all these things of beauty that we see there is someone that created them and this all this beauty is created by a beautiful creator and if we are spent time in the presence of God there comes a moment like hard to explain but when you are in his presence you begin experiencing his beauty you begin experiencing his love you begin experiencing 
God in such a way that he is just so beautiful, that is, he is just so good, that he is just so gracious and merciful. And, you know, one thing that helped me um, understand the love of God and the beauty of God and the beauty of his intentions is, is becoming a father. Like, that's, that's probably the one thing that has changed my relationship with God the most is becoming a father. It's like something that... that uh, I remember looking at the first ultrasound of our first uh, born. It was like the first time and they like turn on the heartbeat for you and you can see it. And like, like something turns inside of you, like something happens. I'm sure those that have kids, like you understand where like that's, like you don't even know who this kid will be, um, what's going to happen. But you understand like this is your son. Like no matter what, you're going to be there for your son. You're going to be there till the end. And um, I remember like our, our youngest boy, uh, Sam, like when he was probably under a year old or maybe right about a year old last year, he had a hernia that, that needed to be operated on. And I remember this moment. Um, I, I wasn't able to be at the hospital hospital but my wife was there and I remember she called me like in the morning it was maybe 7 30 8 o'clock and like she's crying and she's like yeah I, don't know, I was not sure what was going on she was very like confused uh, when she was speaking to her. I couldn't understand what she was saying I could understand she was saying they took Samuel and I'm like like what's going on like who took Samuel and it, finally she told me that you know the nurse came and took Samuel to go get operated I'm like look it's all right you know they're gonna bring him back you know they didn't steal him uh, they're going to bring him back. And, and they, didn't, they didn't take to do him harm. They take, took him to fix him up so that he could be better, right? And, and, um, and I hung up. But as I was thinking, like, we as just, you know, worldly people, people of flesh, if we have such a love for our kids and, like, we are so worried to the point of emotional distress when our kids are taken away from us, even if it's, like, not a bad thing? Like, how, what does God experience when we as his children are taken away from him or when we walk away from him? When we desire not to be in his presence or when we, when given a choice, if I am going to be spending time with him or spending time, you know, on someone else, maybe on a social network or watching something or doing something or, or whatever it may be, um, like I imagine and like what is God feeling? But I don't think that he's experiencing this anger or this thing where he just wants to be like well you know he just wants to to hit you or to zap you know God is 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 a God of love and a God of beauty and so David he says when you spend time in his presence you begin to understand the beauty of God and that God is a God that is beautiful and the third thing that he says he says and to inquire in his temple and we're going to close here. And David says he wants to spend the rest of his days in the presence of God, gazing and understanding the beauty of God. And when all this happens, says to inquire or to meditate in his temple. You know, God, he has a word for every single one of us, for every single believers. God wants to have a relationship with and God wants to talk to us. He wants to share his heart with us. And many times we, we're just not ready to pay that price of this relationship. We're not ready to spend the time in the presence of God. You know, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people in the church that are just not pleasant people. Not beautiful people as, as people. Why? because they don't spend enough time in the presence of God. Let me tell you, if we spend time in the presence of God, if we get to know the beauty of God, we ourselves become beautiful. We ourselves become beautiful people. And man, like, is it not great to deal with beautiful people? Like, I'm not talking about physical appearance. I'm talking about just beautiful people as people. Like, it's so great to just meet nice people people that are just courteous,
people that are just loving, people that are gracious. Like even in, you know, even with all this customer service that we have in America, like I was getting Starbucks earlier today and the lady behind the counter, like she was not a good person. Like she, I don't know what it was, but it was just like, like she was saying all the right things, but like, but you know, and then sometimes you come and there's just like pleasant people. You know, when we are in the church and we're unpleasant, like something's wrong. Like it's not just our personality. Our personality needs to get changed and, and reflected and, and being reflected into the image of Christ. And so I encourage all of us to have the same desire that David did to spend time in his presence, to spend time gazing upon his beauty. And that will make us beautiful. That will make us people that are beautiful within the church. And when we have a church full of beautiful people, man, trust me, people will come. Because that's what people like. That's what people love to spend time with genuinely beautiful people and then David says to inquire and to meditate in his temple when we spend time with God he starts opening up his word to you, to us to every single one of us he starts speaking into our life and a lot of times we just we want a Christianity where we come to church we listen to Eugene have a beautiful message for us and we go home and, and it's like wow that's it i had my word for the week or or on a sunday whatever it may be friends but god wants to share his heart with us individually he wants to open up this word not just to a few people but he opens up to word his word to all that come and spend time with him gaze upon his beauty learn of him and become beautiful like him and then god begins to share his heart with us and then we become more compassionate then we become more loving then we become more understanding and more mindful of those around us so that is what i call all of us and myself today to 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 look at david and use this example and say god today if god would come to me today as he once came in a dream to solomon and he said oh, solomon what do you want from me and if today God comes and he's asking you, what is the most important thing for you? What do you desire most? I hope that in this prayer we can come to God and we say, God, the most important thing for me is your presence. To be in your presence. To spend every day of my life in your presence, gazing upon your beauty and awaiting and inquiring of your word for you to speak into my heart. Let us stand today and come before God and uh, ask him to help us to be more like David, to be more like people that are interested in wanting to be in the presence of God. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this evening, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this word that you have entrusted us with. We thank you, God, for all the men and women that we can find in scripture that we can look at and study and apply their principles, the good principles into our lives. As we look today and study David and the things that he said and the things that he did, God, allow us to be more like him, to come to a point of understanding in our life that the most important thing in our lives is not some sort of an achievement, not some sort of materialistic thing, but the most important thing in my life is to spend the days of my life in your presence to understand and to to graze upon your beauty and so that being surrounded and being in awe of your beauty that we ourselves would be transformed into beautiful people into people that are mindful into people that are gracious into people that are good lord i ask you god let us become a church that is filled with people lord that that are like you that are beautiful that are a, ple a pleasant aroma for those around them, God. People that encourage and lift up and, and lift up those that, that are going maybe through hard times, God. And I ask you, Lord God, for you to, to get us to be in your presence so that you can share your word and share your heart with us, Lord. I ask you, God, Lord, bless our church. Bless um, everyone that is here today, God, to become more and more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.